This is the Plain English Real Estate Show with your host, Rowena Patton, a show that focuses on the real estate market in terms you can easily understand. Call Rowena now. The number is 240-9962 or 1-800-570-9962. Now here's the English girl in the mountains, the agent that I would trust, Rowena Patton. Good morning. This is Rowena Patton and Heather McCurry. Hey, everyone. Big news for the day. Randy got a haircut. I did notice that, by the way. <laughs> Even brought it to his own attention. That's it. Which Randy are you talking about? Both. <laughs> 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 Must be a thing in the air right now about Randy's getting haircuts. Yeah, right. Your name's Randy work. and got a haircut. Call us. Yeah, 828-240-9962. We want to hear your haircut story. Are you having it long? Are you having a ponytail? Are you going back to the 60s? Are you having a little spiky like the other Randy? Yeah, I was going to say. little fluff, little spike. What do you call other, that? Short I was going to say honey. Sides. I was going to say honey got his hair all chopped off. Mm-hmm. He's, mm-hmm. Not, he's not convinced that he likes it yet, but I think it looks good on him. Well, I think three more days and it will look just fine. You're saying that he does it now? It looks great. I he think also- I like it. You could roll him over in a dung pile and he'd look amazing. <laughs> See what love does? You could. It's true. <laughs> it's true. It's I... love in the air. <laughs> love is in the air. <laughs> I was listening. <laughs> We're going down the rabbit hole it's so early. A fun song. Um, I've been, I've forgotten. You know, when you scroll, maybe all you s- stick on the same old music all the time. I don't know. But I flip around all over the place. Mm-hmm. And I'd forgotten the Garth channel. And I'm having so much fun on the Garth. It's really my favorite one, honestly. Watched a Netflix special on him the other day. And it was, he's phenomenal. He's just. I phenomenal. haven't seen that. What's it called? I, Garth. Probably, probably, yeah, yeah. probably called Garth. Garth Brooks. Wait, how, how I remember that one? <laughs> <laughs> Look at Garth. That could be our first trivia question. And that's Garth. What is the Garth Brooks special named on Netflix? And then I'll find out. I'll just get you to do all my work for me. We would appreciate it. And you can that. dial in. You can win a prize. I'm serious. 240-9962. If you're calling in from Mars, 800-570-9962. What is the Garth Brooks special called on Netflix? I hope it was Netflix. It may have been I'm something. trying to win a prize, y'all. <laughs> I'm trying to win a win prize. It. You can't win it. Oh, darn. Well, you know, we're taking our time this morning because we are talking about a subject that's a little close to the heart and a little sad, really, probate. It is a little sad, but I guess depending on whether you're faithful or not, it mm-hmm. isn't sad. I haven't thought of it like that. I don't know. But probate's always a hard one to talk about. Because it is. Because we're all dying. Shock horror. You know, the funny thing is, I grew up with my grandparents, so I've always been um, uh, more in tune with death than the average person, I think. And I've definitely been accused of of being uh, of uh, too in tune with death before. But I'm not sitting around thinking, oh, I'm dying next week, ever. It's just that I know this is a hard one to contend with, but we're all dying. We're all going there. We we're just all... don't ever know when. We don't know when, exactly. And we don't know when our loved ones are going to go or our not loved ones, whatever they are in the moment. Exactly. Well, Heather. I mean, you just don't know. I mean, you could just... Heather has six previous husbands and we're not sure what happened to them. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell the one for 26 years that, or okay? Is it, or is it seven? <laughs> Dwayne, I hope you're not listening. He's not. He's doing concrete work right now with pressure washing business. And she she was actually helping you pressure wash this morning. Do you remember that bit where she, she got the pressure washer and she was pointing it at your face? That wasn't because she was trying to clean you off. She's trying to send you the way of her other seven husbands. Oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. Back to a serious <laughs> note here on the Real Estate News Radio. Back to a serious note. It's because it's, it's a tricky subject to talk about. And that's, I think, why a lot of people don't talk about it. And they don't talk about life insurance. And they don't talk about planning for retirement. And they don't, you know, all that stuff. Because, um, hmm, I do remember, actually, when I was a little girl and my granddad would say, all this will one day be yours. And I'd go, Granddad, and it'd make me cry and because I never, ever wanted to think of him passing away. My grandfather was the hardest death that I had been through. Really? To be honest with you, yes. That was my one true, true. You should boo. Yeah, and he was 20 years older than my grandmother. So he died at 96. I mean, he lived a good, healthy life. How old were you? 
Golly, um, 11. Yeah, I was 13. It's was a very, 11. very hard time, especially when you're a little girl. So granddad's listening up out there when you got little biddies running. And you know, you know how hard it is when you got little biddies running around and they love their grandpa. I'm as my granddad. In fact, um, when I wrote the book, I put a picture of my granddad in the front and, and devoted the book to him. And it says, to my, bring a lump to my throat now, it says, to my grandfather, Ronald Patton, who always threw me in at the deep end knowing I would swim. Because he taught me, uh, when I was five or six, he taught me chess at six. I oh, think really? he knew he was going to pass early. Well, How old were early, you? Really. I was 13. That's right. It's that hard time when you're just becoming a it's woman. It's like no holidays are ever the same. Um, yeah. There's just a lot of emotional stuff that goes yeah. on with that. My grandfather was pretty old, you know, to die at 96. I was 11, but we used to always play hot hands. Yeah. Mine was 78, so he wasn't young. But at the same time, um, it's it's still it's it still takes a part of you. What's hot hands? <laughs> it's where you put, you, normally sure. you would put two hands <laughs> facing up, two hands, you, uh, your opponent would be two hands on top. And the object is to flip your hand and smack their hand. Oh. And, and so on and so forth. Well, my grandfather, oh. he, he shook pretty bad. Mm. And he couldn't do that. But we used to play on his chair that he always sat in. His old black rocking chair. You know, big leather thing. That's, I, I still, you know, oh, yeah. I can picture it. Yeah. And I would sit on the floor and put my hand on the wooden arm rest mm-hmm. of it. And we would play hot hands off of that chair. Did he have a pillow at the back of the chair? No. No. Did no. he wear brill cream? Did he do what? Did he wear brill cream? <laughs> what is that? You know what brill cream is. Like Randy, what is it? Just a little dabble, do ya? <laughs> brill cream's what, what men put in the hair in the 60s. You know, no, he that. had very, very thin hair. He well, wasn't that's bald. That's why they use brill cream. Brill cream. It holds it all back. You know the slick back hair you yeah, saw? Yeah, that the... wasn't him. I wish I had a picture of him. I would yeah. show you. I love that man. I still have his driver's license. Oh, <laughs> Those are the things that I kept through. In, in inheritance, I should say. Yeah. But that went through to my grandmother, my mama. Yeah. And then when she passed away, my mom kept everything. And then when my mom passed away and I was going uh, through all of her you? stuff, How I found you? all of this Good. stuff. That belonged to my grandmother and my grandfather. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot. I mean, just dealing with memories and how do you do that? It's so hard. And, and that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about, well, you know, it's got this big word, probate. But we're really talking about what do you do when somebody passes? Like, where do you start? You, it, it, for many, many people, you're in a, a, a period of heartbreak. The, the whole f- you, can, you can go into paralysis. It's so difficult. And we help people uh, um, through this period a lot. And we have a fantastic guest on the show today who's uh, Mariah McKinney. That's not Mariah McCary. That's the wrong word. No, Mariah Carey. Yeah. It's M- Mariah McKinney this morning. Mariah, do we have you there? I am here. Can you Yay! hear me? Yay! <laughs> I'm so glad you are here. Hi. I um, actually, in, in open court, in criminal court in McDowell County, the judge accidentally called me Mariah Carey when he assigned me to it. He <laughs> did not. Friend. That's hilarious. <laughs> I won't care who that judge was, but he knows who he is. And everyone erupted in laughter. So That's fun. very funny. Can you sing? <laughs> I mean, I do sing a little bit, but oh. it's nothing like Mariah Carey. I mean, you don't do the whistle? Octave, yeah. I mean, no. Nobody can. Her voice sounds better than ours, Ro. She's got a more <laughs> level pitch. You and I are pretty deep. Yeah, probably right. You're probably, you mean Mariah? Yeah, Mariah. This is Mariah. Pretty, yes, not this the, Mariah. So she could probably sing. She can probably carry a note and hold People it. People with deep voices can sing, Yeah, too. we're called bass, aren't we? Well, right. But, <laughs> oh, my gosh. As you can see, we're having a fun show, as usual, Mariah. Why don't you introduce yourself you. and tell us... Uh, well, the, really, the conversation yesterday. Why we had a uh, we we were about on the phone for all afternoon together because we hit it off and talked about how we like to educate the public. Tell people your field of expertise, Mariah. Yeah, and I'll keep that part really short because we're going to try to give people some useful information. Yes, not about us, but I am with Garlock and McKinney, and our main office is in Black Mountain. And I've been an attorney almost 18 years now in North Carolina and dedicated my whole practice to 
you know, drafting wills and probating wills and guardianship and all of those things. Um, we also have to sell a lot of real estate as sellers or we help our clients as sellers. So we know a lot about selling real estate when after someone's passed away, um, either as an estate or heir sell. And we also do a lot of sales for um, in guardianships when somebody is legally adjudicate and competent. Um, where someone else is selling as their guardian, and um, and it's very similar to the estate sale process. There's some differences, mm-hmm. but so we do a lot of crossover with, you know, everything that we do with estates and guardianships. It, if someone owns real estate, we're right there in the real estate world that you're in, um, so we can relate um, to a lot of the things that I think your <clears throat> your clients are going through. Yeah, I think so. We talked yesterday about uh, for most people, I think in this situation, they would say, can I give you this big heap of everything that's going on in my life right now? And you just take care of everything, please, and shuffle me along, you know, especially the person that's closest to the person that's passed. Um, and, And there's lots of legal stuff. There's lots of paperwork. There's lots of differing and differing opinions. You've got the funeral home. You've got um, the estate planners. You've got the real estate agents. You've got the attorneys. You've got all these people going. You've got the the the, the guy at the bar saying, maybe you should do this next. You need to go down there. You need to do that. And how overwhelming is all of that when somebody has just lost someone? You know, especially if it's unexpected. Yeah, I mean, the best um, estate uh, probate attorneys that I know um, in our county, and there are a lot of great ones. We have a we have good relationships with one another. They will help be the facilitator in that process. Yes. Um, so they they should really be the one that's helping the client um, get access to the other professionals they need, like CPAs, real estate agents, um, you know, financial advisors for whatever they're inheriting. Um, litigation attorneys, if there's litigation involved. So the, the state attorney should really be the hub or the facilitator of everything the client needs now that this, this death has occurred. <clears throat> and um, we definitely try to do that, um, work with the client and get them what they need to yeah. get to the next phase in life. So the last thing somebody wants to do when someone's passed First of all, it may be that you've gone through some kind of traumatic event. Well, obviously, death is a traumatic event. But it may have been occurring for a week or three months or six Mm -hmm. months, and now we may be at the end of it. Or it may have been occurring for a week, and suddenly it's, um, you know, the lights are off. And I'm guessing the first place most people go is the funeral home, and the funeral home ends up being the director of the act. Am I correct? Yeah, a lot of times that is that is where they start to gather information. And there's a lot of good information um, to be gained from the funeral home because um, they'll initiate the death certificate, which is the, one of the first pieces of paper you have to have to do anything else. And so they actually, the funeral home um, representative sits with you and fills that paperwork out. Mm. And that that is just like a fill in the blank form. And they okay. ask you the questions, and then that goes into populating the death certificate. Um, mm-hmm. And then, you know, that goes into the system, and Social Security gets notified. So if it's a, an older person, um, Social Security will stop making those payments um, once they get informed of, you know, the person's death. And so the really the funeral home is the initiating um, entity in the first document. Interesting. Um, okay. Interesting. I remember going mm-hmm. through that with my mom. Yeah. We gosh. did that. And my mom had four different names, so that was pretty trying. Oh, wow. Yeah. Probably well, could have used yeah. somebody like you, but we handled it. It's so, really somehow. important to get the social security number right. <laughs> because sometimes, and that's the that's thing true. that's so shocking about how death certificates um, get, you know, populated is that once, you know, once it goes into the legal process, it has a seal and it looks really fancy. And, you know, but it actually just initiates from just regular people sitting down at a table and filling out a fill in the blank form. And so there could be errors that would cause you to have to go get a corrected death certificate later. And that's really difficult to do. So one of the things that's important is to get the information right. And, you know, in that time where you're grieving, 
um, you're just not thinking about accuracy. But it is important to get it to get it right. Well, and if it's your husband or your wife, then you may know. But how would you know your mom's social security number? Not everybody would know. We had all our records. I mean, we had all of that. We had access to it. It's like what you were saying, Rose. It's like the question, where do you start? And really in that in that moment, even if you had a checklist or you knew what all the steps were, because um, I think about, you know, <laughs> me, you know, grief can just fog your brain. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, in that moment, sometimes you just kind of go into autopilot and intuitively you figure out, oh, I've got to go find the social security card or some document. But sometimes people just tell you that, you know, and so thankfully, if you are at the funeral home or talking to whoever, someone's going to say to you, we have to have that. And then you go and you look for that paperwork. So there's a lot of triggering events, even if you don't know what to do right. exactly right away, that someone's going to ask you for that information to get you to step two, <laughs> you know, and, and that's probably one of our, the main things that we say to people, people sometimes they are paralyzed by grief. Yes. And then sometimes people are, the way that they deal with grief is they go into like this task mode. Yes. And um, you really kind of, we, what we work to do is coach them to be somewhere in between, um, to meet the deadlines and the, and the benchmarks that need to be met, but to not be too paralyzed and to not move too quickly because in the probate process, time can actually be your friend. Mm. Um, things can develop as they need to. And some things you have to wait for. So the first thing we tell people when they call us, as we say, what? It was yesterday or what? It was Saturday. No, okay, take a deep breath. You can take some time. We try to do triage on are there any emergency issues like, you know, is there litigation? Did you get served with, you know, litigation? Or is the home in subject of tax foreclosure? Or yes. are they behind in the mortgage payment? Is there something that's Is there a leak through issue? the roof? Wow. Yeah. 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 So we run kind of triage on that. And then we say, okay, you don't need to do anything. Let's make you an appointment like four to six weeks from now. You don't have to do anything right now. But if something comes up that you're worried about, call us. Yes. That and makes so the sense. The first thing to do is to take a deep breath and to, to take some time um, to, to grieve. Now, by using somebody in your position, Mariah, I'm guessing that people don't really end up paying much more and they get it done very correctly. How much does it cost or can you go and do it on your own? Great question. So, yeah, and that was on, on my list here to mention. I'm a lawyer, so, you know, anytime a lawyer says you need a lawyer to do something, it sounds very self-serving. But also, would you go try to replace your engine in your car yourself, right? Uh, yeah. No. That doesn't make sense. And so, and so I've seen, I actually oversaw the Wake County probate office in Buncombe County. So I've probably seen more wills probated than most lawyers. I've also seen all the bad wills that people try to do themselves online. I've got several right now in my office I'm trying to probate that don't meet the requirements for probate. And so that creates this whole long you know, wow. process where you have to go and try to figure out how to probate it, right? To make the person's wishes um, be upheld. And so I say to people, don't do your own will the powers of a journey online, um, you really do need a lawyer through the probate process. And and you need someone that knows when you really need an estate and when you don't and what there's options. Mm. That You really need advice. Because if you start down that path and you do something that you really didn't need to do, you're going to, that's going to cost more. And it's a burden on you. Um, but no, it's not, you know, there's not... <laughs> It's not a good idea to try to cut corners or find the cheapest game in town when yeah. you're doing this. You want it to be done right. You want someone that can advise you about why you're doing the things you're doing and, and how that's helping you get to the next step. And so, like I said, there's lots of good lawyers in Asheville that I'm, do that. I'm going to say something outrageous, uh, but not so outrageous, because we do have listeners who are preppers you know, who are prepping for something happening and making sure they've got food put by and everything else. And there are also a lot of people who are older who like getting prepared for mm -hmm. their coming end. Mm -hmm. You know, they know they're going or they know they'll be, you know, they might eventually. be in their 80s. Well, eventually they'll Yeah, be. we're all going, right? But they might be in their 80s and they don't want to leave this big mess behind for their kids. Could somebody like that get with somebody like you and do the preparation? And, and you know, that sheet of 
all the stuff that you need to kick this process off. Why isn't it with the will? Why isn't it like an addendum to the will that, you know, here's my full name, here's my six names that I used to have, here's my <laughs> six dead husbands, we're not sure what happened to them. That one was for Heather. You may not have been listening earlier. And um, <laughs> and the social security number, my three mm-hmm. previous addresses, whatever all that stuff is, how isn't there an addendum to the will that's got all of that on, if that's not a silly question? Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. Um, it, I wouldn't really say that it's an addendum to the will. And, and what you're saying makes a lot of sense because some people who are working with financial advisors, the financial advisors give them this whole list of things to have in their box or with their documents, mm-hmm. right? And those are those kind of things like, you know, your bank accounts and all that. Um, and so, yeah, that is something that we haven't included as a part of our practice. We kind of talk about it if the clients raise the issue, but it always comes down to cost, right? We yeah. could certainly help people do that, um, but they don't really always want to pay a lawyer to help them with those kind of practical issues. But that's definitely something um, that would be helpful is that if people would put those things with their wills and also powers of attorney, you really need all of the documents, um, yes. not just the will. Um, But you also need powers of attorney. And yes, if they had that information in there, it would help even if they were alive, but they became incapacitated and somebody had to start making their decisions for them under Mm -hmm. the powers of attorney, Mm -hmm. Um, like even their doctors, you know, names and and phone numbers and and, and medical, like their list of their medicines, um, things like that. So, yeah, whenever there's someone else involved helping them, in addition to us, like a financial advisor, I think that they have more of that in their packet in the, of documents than not. But when there's not someone like that involved, you're right. I think that there's definitely a gap there um, where we could help people more um, and, and explain to them the things that need to be with their documents, for sure. So quick question. When you actually make a will with someone, do you register the will or do they just carry it out, sealed, signed, and put it somewhere? Like, do you register in the courthouse? That's a great question. Um, So the will doesn't become um, really registered or filed for public record purposes until someone passes away. There are options for safekeeping the will. Um, Some law firms will allow people to keep it in their own space. Um, Also, we usually just tell people a fireproof box or safe or like one of those fire envelopes. We don't recommend lockboxes because then you get into when the documents are needed, if you're the only one named on the box and, you know, you can't get to the documents when you need them. Um, But there is no formal registration. Um, Another option that's not as commonly used is people will take their will to the clerk's office um, and, you know, that's just at their local courthouse. Um, There's an estate's office. And they can sign a paper to put it on for safekeeping. And that's like in a safe in the courthouse. But um, there's downsides to that as well. Um, If you change it, I'm guessing. Well, that's one thing. You do have to be very diligent about remembering where your will is. And there's a lot of people that forget (laughs) where their wills are. Um, but also, it, like, if the person becomes incapacitated mm-hmm. and then they have, like, a power of attorney acting for them, um, you can't really go get the will um, because there's a fear of it being destroyed. And then Gosh. sometimes it's not an exact science. The clerks are supposed to look in those safekeeping records whenever they're informed that someone has died, but sometimes it gets missed. Yeah. And then you think someone doesn't have a will that does. So I... You know, it it sounds really safe, but really the best I've found is when people just inform their family where they're keeping it safe and they keep it safe somewhere in their home um, in a fireproof um, container. That's the best I've seen other than like in a law firm safe. But again, there has to be notes with your copies of your documents that reminds everybody. Like we always give our clients a letter that says, Either, you know, today you have been given these documents or today we've given you this document, but we've kept these in our Mm thing. So that way there's a record of it. It's, you know, it is sometimes like a scavenger hunt calling around to law firms saying, do you have a will for so Oh, I did that. Um, (laughs) 
Yeah. I did so that. that does happen. That does happen. We couldn't find my mom's will. We oh. finally found her. I finally found it in a storage unit with a bunch of papers that uh, had she had just yeah. hoarded in there. And who knows if, if another one had been met. I mean, that's always the thing for me, that people often make a will in their 30s when they first have kids, and then it changes over time. You know, uh, and I think the other thing is that often people are recommended to have a copy of the will and give it out to their children or their family members. The issue there is if you have three children, you don't necessarily give the same amount to each one of the children. Yeah, Mm -hmm. we usually strongly discourage um, our clients uh, from giving copies of their will. Why is that? Why is that? Well, because... Well, because of what you just said. Well, um, all three. You know, and also, they could change their mind. Yes. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. And so what I tell them is a will really isn't, it's not, it's not final. You know, estate planning and will drafting, it's not a one and done. You don't walk into some place and get it, and then you're like, I'm good. Um, you really have to think about it. Like the things that we're talking about, you have to think about where are my legal documents, you know, every three to five years. And are they still what I want? Like, you know, did I name my best friend who was a nurse and now we don't even talk anymore, you know, so they can't really make my healthcare decisions for me. And then do your powers of attorney fall apart because all of your people aren't there anymore, you know? Well, they've so died too. That, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you're right. Most people don't, don't do that <laughs> um, very well. But um, but that's what we recommend when we talk to people is we say, you know, it doesn't have to be us, but you need to talk to someone. It can be your financial advisor. It can be another lawyer. But in about three to five years, you need to think about this again. And, it, and I tell them this, too. If there's any major life change event, right, someone dies, um, someone need, gets, you know, disabled, gets an accident, that's a major life event. You need to have your documents reviewed if that happens. Mm-hmm kids are born, all of the above. So, Mariah, exactly. g- give us uh, one of the most difficult ones that you've ever dealt with. Oh, my goodness. Um, so many, <laughs> right? Many. Well, there are. Um, huh. Have you ever been you breaking? Know? Have you ever been? Uh, is there any fisticuffs ever involved? Or like any what? Fisticuffs. Any? Her fists are up and she's shaking them at me. If that helps yeah. with what she's saying. So I don't know if this was the most difficult one, but it is a little bit comical. And I, <laughs> I kick myself every day for not taking a picture of this. Um, <laughs> I had an estate where it came down to this painting, and it was this creepy old man, like, you know, his eyes literally followed you. And it was, they called it the old <laughs> the man with the scene. And the and the and it was a real painting that someone had done. And so the, the you know one of the heirs decided he was going to hold everything up if he didn't get that original painting. We were almost going to have to go to a hearing about it. But my client brilliantly found someone who literally can replicate painting. Oh, and so the painting was replicated. So all of the heirs got a replicated painting. Wow. And so we were able to settle that, but I'm just really mad at myself for not keeping a picture of that painting. That's, oh, yes, I would love to see that. You know, it is interesting, stuff and things, and I do want to come on to that. So we sold a house a few years ago. Um, I'm not going to say we're, it's such a fascinating house. I wish I could give you the full story, but it was a house in Hendersonville, and um, the whole thing it was about eight hundred thousand dollars, and we and it was at a time when houses weren't selling so fast. We brought the buyer in; everything was great. The the sellers had met the buyers, and it was all wonderful. Everything was moving perfectly, and at the closing table, we had uh, a lot going on because the buyers wanted an ottoman that was at the end of the bed. And the sellers already said, no, that that is a special, it really wasn't, they did have some special furniture pieces, which, you know, many people do pass down from their family. This was just an expensive ottoman. <laughs> it was a couple of thousand dollars or something. And the seller did not want to let that ottoman go. And the buyer did not, did not want to close on the house because this ottoman wasn't in the sale. It, the, the closing got put off for three days over an ottoman. 
on an eight hundred thousand dollar house. Sometimes the smallest things can, oh, especially yeah. when it's personal property, can hold things up. So, let's talk about personal property. So, s- someone passes, whether it's unexpected or not, because quite frankly, many of us can't be bothered to go through our own stuff and things. Including me, I might be one of those people. Heather helps me from time to time with that, and. So imagine now we're in our 60s or 70s or 80s and it's like all that stuff and things out there in the garage in 19 different boxes and stuff and things, uh, just stuff and things everywhere. All my knickknacks. Like I can't, you know, my grandkids gave me those. I can't get rid of those. All the stuff and things that you've got in the house. What would you say to somebody? You've been through this uh, numerous times when they're going to pass all this stuff and things onto the family. What does the family feel like being faced with all this stuff and things? Um, that is truly one of the it's 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 kind of both sides of the coin. For some people, it's one of the most difficult things that they have to do, mm-hmm. but it's also the thing that they have to do because it's a part of the grieving process. Mm-hmm. And they and they actually get a lot of, you know, they have those emotional moments and they cry over the things, um, but they, but it helps them through the grief process. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really, it's really up to the client, you know, how they handle it. A lot of times there aren't many companies out there that actually do estate sales where they come in and clean it out. Mm-hmm. There's places that will sell it if you get it to them. So unfortunately, um, the executor, the family, and you know, sometimes all of the, the, like if it's children, um, you know, sometimes all four of them or whatever come or two of them come and they work, but often it falls to one person and they have to, and again, that's something we can talk through with them. Um, but they have to like get, you know, those big dumpsters, you, you know, rent yeah. it and put in the yard and put the trash in there. And then they do the donation bags for the goodwill. And then they try to separate everything out that, and we're talking about non-valuable things and in a situation where we don't have a bunch of creditors, of course, knocking at the door. But um, it really does fall to, you know, one or more people to deal with all of that stuff. And there's, it's, it's up to them how, you know, how many, you know, professionals they hire to come in and help them or if they just do it themselves. It, it is quite a burden for, sometimes it takes people six months. Yeah, it's a huge to, burden. To do all that. We have yeah. one recently yeah. where it was left to one couple it and was, there were three other siblings. Oh, it, it was sad. It was yeah, horrible. It, it, makes, it made me so angry it was actually, just watching it. It was actually the spouse that yeah. had to divide up all the clothing, yeah. all the personal items, tag everything with, monetary amount it per was... the other siblings who couldn't be bothered to come and do yeah. it yeah i mean every that, that was the was... annoying oh. piece it wasn't it was you know when when you're i don't know somewhere else in the country or something it's like listen i can't deal with this right now and please take it on and obviously you can do whatever you think is right but not when you're mm-hmm. sitting in wisconsin saying mm-hmm. and i need this and i need that and i need you mm-hmm. and i can't believe you i think you're trying to steal this it's it's yeah. and that happens in families it absolutely blows it families does. up so if you are over 40 i want you to take a look at all the stuff and things in your house i want you to get that will done properly don't do it online you heard you heard mariah and start going through everything. And it also feels much better in life. That's the truth. It feels way better in life. So, to know that you have something in place. Right. And that you're not going to burden, well, from, you know, right. children or, right. sib- you know, whatever. Well, you're burdening yourself is the point, right? If you look around your house right now and you look at all the crap in your house where Heather's looking at me funny. Why are you looking at me funny? I'm A not. lot of the crap has gone away. <laughs> If you if you look around your house and you're looking at all, all the crap in your house, okay. it's harder to clean for one thing. It's harder it's to vacuum. True. It's harder to find anything. I don't have knickknacks because I don't like to dust. Well, a lot of people do have knickknacks. They do, and that was a really big thing. I just when I, my kids came around, either a they were going to break them, right? And my mom was a hoarder, and she had all kinds of stuff. Yeah, and it just drove me crazy as a child. So I grew up not wanting to have that so i'm pretty fortunate there well and it's it's the i think uh back to mariah's point about how cathartic it can be going through things so give your kids or your family a small box of things to go 
through. Mm -hmm. Not the entire mm -hmm. freaking house that takes you six months because <laughs> it's awful. You don't know what to do with it. Well, and the other thing I noticed with some that I have seen in my short life here of 51 years is that I've been – people hold checks – stubs or the return checks back yes. in the day yeah. from 1969 yeah and i mean i went through boxes of nothing but return yeah. checks why 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 do we hold on to that i don't know i really don't know so you know what i can tell you is from personal experience so my grandfather passed when i was 13 my grandmother passed um a month short of my 21st birthday why is that important because my grandfather had drawn up a will where everything was going to me. It was a very small house. I didn't grip it with a silver spoon or something, but um, everything was being left to me on my 21st birthday. And my grandmother lasted two months before. And the um, the attorney was actually my cousin. And my father's brother actually called up on the the morning my my grandmother died and said, what did I get? And this is what happens in families. Mariah will tell you, this is what yeah. happens in families. It happens all the time. And, okay. and my cousin said, uh, he was so outraged that, you know, somebody would be that callous, said, actually, it's all left to Rowena. And he said he took glee in saying that. And they pushed it through <laughs> early because it was only a couple of months. And, of course, I was devastated. And, but going through the house was one of the most difficult things. And I was 21 years old um, that I'd ever done. And my, my grandmother died of Alzheimer's, so I'd gone through my first job getting a mortgage so that my grandmother could actually be at home instead of in the hospital with a nurse. So I'd just gotten a mortgage for the first time, which at 21 is, you know, kind of early. Um, for a house that I was going to inherit, I got a mortgage on it so that it would pay for, that money would pay for the nurse to be in place. So I'd already been through a lot. And now I was going through all this stuff and things and finding all kinds of things that I basically lived there. I had no idea, you know. I did find... A ticket to the Titanic. That was pretty amazing. That uh, my wow. grandmother, yeah, it was amazing. So uh, my grandmother was meant to be on the Titanic and they decided she was too young. She was in service, which basically in England means it's slavery. Um, big, you know, 1912, there were uh, 13 children in, in her family, which is very common in, in those days. So, uh, you know, her dad died and her mom schlepped her off to London. Schlepped, schlepped her off Here to London. Here goes that word again. In, in upstairs, downstairs. You've all seen that on TV now. And uh, she was a, a servant. But at 12, they decided she was too young and she did not get to go on the Titanic, which is pretty cool because that's why I'm here. <laughs> we wouldn't be having this show today had she had this ticket. However, there were, I found rosary beads. She's Scottish. I found rosary beads. I found old pictures. And I just, I wished to God that she had been able to go through all that stuff with me when she was alive. So or there's talk the other about lesson. It or tell you about exactly. it. Exactly. So there's the other lesson. That's, go that's... through that stuff and things yeah. with your kids and grandkids. You think, oh, they're not going to be interested. When you've gone, we are interested and there's nothing we can get back. Also, mm -hmm. I tape them. Like I so wish I could hear their voices. Oh. So do videos with them. And I'm talking to you as the person that ain't going to be here anymore. Do videos with them. We've all got cell phones now. We'll get get your grandkids to do videos. You know, you've got we those forever. We actually do storyboards. We do storyboards for that very reason. Yeah, yeah we do. For memories. We do um, uh, memories videos when we're in a house so that you can capture the memories because a lot of people are clinging on to their... It's really a show about clinging on, isn't it? That's what this is about, whether you're all the way through your life because, Mariah, I know this isn't going to surprise you. We have lots of people in their 50s and sixties who are clinging on to their five bedroom houses, wondering if their their adult children that now live in a different part of the country or not are gonna come home for the holidays. We have mm -hmm. someone right now that's still I mean, he's still alive, but he's trying to figure out what to do with his house. Oh and yeah. His he was like, I'll just give it to my daughter. Yeah. And his daughter's like and I don't know, pick a state far away, Washington State or something. And doesn't want the house. She's not coming home. And right. he's just got all kinds of stuff. And yeah. they're trying to figure out what they want to do with it and how do you disperse it now yeah. to lighten their load for their yeah. last couple of years of life. And lighten your own load. Yeah, is the lighten thing. their you know, load. It's yeah. lighten your own load, not just for your kids. Because a lot of you sitting at home listening right now going, the kids can deal with it when I'm dead. Right? You've heard people say that as well. <laughs> 
they're fighting over this, they're fighting over that. They can all do with, with, with when I'm dead. I actually be, yep. used to be part of a family where one of them got stickers and would put stickers on the bottom of like vases. So <laughs> he was getting what? So that he wanted. Are you getting He marked his yeah. own? Yeah. Yeah, he went through and marked. Stuff. There yeah. you go. There's the idea. And Everyone have your children and your family come in and label the things they want, <laughs> and then you yep, can go through and decide if it's correct. They use sticky notes these days. <laughs> That's right. Those little yard sale things, you know, where you put the price on it, like yeah. $2 or something, the little round dots. Just stick everybody's um, name on it. I will say this because maybe it's something useful for more than just your one person, but it is very um, – it can be – it, it can be a tax gain nightmare later mm-hmm. if real estate is sold, if it's gifted during life. So I caution anyone who's thinking about giving anybody anything um, to go. There's 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 planners um, that can do different types of real estate transactions where you can like buy 1% and yes. those kinds of things. Um, and you don't, you, you want to be really careful if, B- before you just give something because there's there's there could be major tax consequences to that yeah and that's a big big deal the last thing you want it's kind of like winning the lottery when you win 500 billion dollars and you walk away with 10 right okay right. Big, big exaggeration however at least you've got the money to pay it then if you are mm-hmm. gifted something by your parents and they're trying to do the right thing and then you're left with this tax implication that you can't pay you're in trouble in fact that is a classic case in the uk with historic homes because the historic homes you know lords and ladies of wherever um have these massive homes that take massive upkeep and it's not funded by the state anymore so often they pass away and it's left to their kids and the kids go bankrupt literally mariah are you talking about more like gifting of houses and stuff like that you're not talking about like the little inside what does oh, she right. call them stuff and yeah. things yeah. stuff and things give, give away your, your your like grandmother's china that's fine yeah um. you're talking about like houses something like that because i know that Dwayne, my husband when his mother was planning for her stuff she put the house over into Dwayne and his sister's mm-hmm. and brother's name. Mm-hmm. You want to talk about something changing. Um, his brother ended up passing away mm-hmm. before the mother did. Mm-hmm. She had to go back and take him yeah. off of everything. Then it was Dwayne and Carolyn. And then yep. she ended up selling her house. So then they had to put the house back yeah. into her name. <laughs> and oh, so no. we all had to go sign papers because I had gotten married since then. But she yeah. was that prepared. If she would have died... In that home, yeah, I don't think they were left with that because of a year count or something. What about tax implications? I'm not saying, I'm not saying that's never an option, but but deeding something to someone during life and like keeping a life estate or whatever, it's it's almost like the last option. Like after so many other things are, it's like one of the most um, quickie things that like somebody comes in and says, I want to deed my house to my kids thing that like a real estate attorney will do. But there's all these disclaimers. Like if you look at that, they give, they always give you this piece of paper and it's like, you know, we're not giving you tax advice. We're not doing a title search. You know, you might owe gift taxes. Like there's all these things gotcha. that don't aren't included in a $250 mm, deed. Gotcha. And all they're doing is giving you what you're asking for, but you're doing it without understanding it's actually really gotcha. best. I got you. And I just know there's a CPA or your yeah. financial plan. And there's a big in. timeline on a lot of stuff. You know, yeah. I know that time works in mysterious ways when you're dealing with real estate and right. stuff like that. Well, and think about it like this. The people like there, there's people I know that they bought um, this property in Madison County for $10,000. And if their heirs were going to sell it, it might be worth $400,000. If they gift it during their life, there's all that built in gain. But if they wait until they die, mm. then the kids get it at the value it's worth now. So that's a lot of capital gains tax. Yeah. So you mean it would be better so, to do it during life? No, Mm-mm. it's usually better to strategize either a partial sale at market value um, or wait until death. But you do have to factor in like long term care. And Medicaid, and you know, it just takes. Um, There's a lot of really that, yeah. down. It's and if, that's the thing is that sometimes people think they're doing the right thing. They're they're helping their kids, and they're doing good planning by going ahead and deeding it now. 
Yeah. And that's not often. Right. I right think thing. a lot of people do it in case they do have to go into assisted, um, not yeah. li- maybe assisted right. living or nursing mm-hmm. home skilled facilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's why they do it, because they don't want to lose everything they've worked so hard for for their children. Right. But there's more sophisticated ways to I've do heard it that. where it also helps. Yeah. I learned that. Because I learned you, that the other day. Yep. And and it has to be more than five years, like five years Correct. in a day for it to even be valid. And Correct. Medicaid changes their rules all the time. So that if Medicaid decided tomorrow it was going to be 10 years now. Oh, yeah. You know, they can apply it retroactively. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff like that. I learned a lot. I did not know that there were other ways. I mean, here I am 51 years old, and I'm thinking Dwayne's mom did it all right. You know, everything was right. She was protected. Everything was good. And then I was talking to a friend of mine that I just found out was also Mm -hmm. does what you do in another law firm here. He does elderly care. Is it called Mm -hmm. elderly Elderly something. Elderly law, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. one. <laughs> Anyways, and he was telling me all kinds of stuff, and I was sitting there just flabbergasted. I was like, wow, yeah. there's all these different options? When you don't know what's going to happen either. It's it's a sort of Boolean code, if that, yeah. then this. And, of course, none of us know what's going to happen. Are we going to need long-term care? Are we going to get Alzheimer's? Are we going to, are we going to, are we going to? You know, you just don't know mm-hmm. what's going to happen, and therefore you can't necessarily uh, uh, legislate to pull something out of your estate 10 years earlier because you know you're going to need long-term care in 10 years' time. Mm-hmm. You just don't know. So basically, Mariah, well, you're... Heather's family, though, is the example of what I usually tell people when we start probate or when we go down the path of this. Like, sometimes it hinges on is everyone really getting along as well as you think they are. Mm-hmm. Yes. So sometimes you're really... It's almost like gambling. Like, okay, sure, if you do your plan this way, do your kids really, like, will they really, when tragedy hits, will they really consider everybody's interest and what's best for you? And in your case, that that was the case. Um, You guys all agreed to sign the paperwork. In cases where we get involved, where it's a guardianship and someone did what your mother-in-law did, sometimes we have to initiate litigation Mm -hmm. to get that property back. Yeah, I, yeah. That's a and that's a problem. And you can, mm-hmm. and I think what Mariah is saying is, you can feel like that will happen, and you can be the matriarch of the family and go, "Oh, that would never happen in our family." It happens all the time. Oh, in families people get greedy. That, I mean, people get it, greedy. Exactly. They start in a struggle period or something. And no, Dwayne's family was very fortunate mm-hmm. with that. Mm-hmm. They really followed through with his mom's wishes for everything. When my grandmother was sick, so I'm 20 at this point, I'm actually at the hospital as well. So I'm 20 at this point, dealing with all this, getting the nurse in. My uncle has a daughter who whose husband has just left her and she's got a kid. And he's trying to get my cousin into the house so that they can be sitting tenants when my grandmother passes. Mm-hmm. Like that's the kind of stuff that goes on. I mean, Mariah could tell a story after story, oh, I'm, I'm sure. sure. And when you've been through something like that, it 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 blo- literally blows up a family. Yeah, we've been. I was very I was very fortunate. Even when my own mom passed, my brother and I never had a really tight relationship. But when she did pass, I mean, I did my part. He did his, and we probably had yeah. a little bit of resentment towards each other with certain things and the way it handled it. But we got through it. We divided it equally, and, yeah. and we did go through with my mom's wishes that we found out after we found the will. <laughs> Which I'm sure that's how it, it usually happens. So again, this is a plea to people who are still alive. Sort this mm-hmm. stuff out the best you can yeah. and educate yeah. yourselves. Agreed. And get rid of the stuff and things, because the stuff and things, some small ring that's worth $200, can be the thing that the entire family blows up blows up over. I mean, you must have seen that little stuff, Mariah. I know you know I mean, what I'm talking about. You hate to say it, but I mean, wedding bands or yeah. wedding rings. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. The stuff that, you know, you're sitting there, you're looking at going, I'm going to give that to my daughter or my granddaughter. Yeah. Those things disappear. Yeah, I don't know a company that replicates those. I know. <laughs> those those really disappear. Am I wrong? <laughs> have you heard of those disappearing? Actually, I do know who will replicate them, and it's the great old-fashioned jewelers at the top of the Asheville Mall. Who am I talking about, Randy? I can't think. You, you're the strip it's mall be, behind expensive. Chili's. If, if you don't have David the ring, Christman. though. David Creasman's Jewelers. Creasman's Jewelers. Yeah. Yeah, if you don't have if the ring. If you don't have the ring, you can't do I mean. SOL. Yeah. Unfindable. Yeah. So. Creasman's uh, is amazing, though. So 
Uh, maybe, okay, if you know your kids are going to be fighting over that, maybe not the diamond. They can go and buy their own diamonds. So here's the other lesson, I think, for parents who are like, oh, you know, oh, I've got to work hard all my life for, for my kids. No, you really don't. In fact, I grew up um, around a lot of kids who were born with a silver spoon in their mouth, and I'm more successful than almost all of them now, and I wasn't. Um, and, you know, I think for a lot of those kids, their, their work ethic is taken away. They all always know something is going to be there. Literally half of those kids I grew up with would go, well, all this is going to be mine one, one day, so I'm not going to have to worry too much. Like that, I think My dad's going to outlive my inheritance. Cool. <laughs> I'm serious. And this man, now I have been through a unorganized death, a halfway, for the most part, organized death. My father has dotted all the I's and crossed all of the T's. Um, we know exactly, I don't know if my brother knows, but I know exactly what is in place and what needs to be done if he goes before I go. At the rate he's going, that night, <laughs> he might outlive me or either he's, I mean, and he's been very, he's very educated and very smart and very planned and I didn't have a silver spoon. Right. So, right. I mean, you know, but he's still... Hopefully has my back. Somewhere. There, there you go. So, Mariah, can you? Be- thank you so much for today. I cannot believe we're thank almost you, at the end guys. of the show, and we've got another couple of minutes left. And I want to give the couple of minutes over to you because, oh my gosh, you you got it going on. Thank you. Oh, thank you, guys. <laughs> what would you tell Back people out? <laughs> what would you tell people out there right now? Of course, we can help you. You know, all that stuff and things that needs removing, we can help you with that. Making improvements on your property, if you need it to sell it, we can help you with that. We can even get cash offers brought for you. Anything else that, that you know, auction services, cleaning services, of course, your, your attorney to help you through all of this. And you've heard from a really great one today. Mariah, what, in your closing words to the people who are still alive that maybe are thinking, I've got 20 years or, or, or less left, what would you tell them today? I think take the advice that Rowena said and um, man, downsize your stuff. My, my husband and I started this phrase about a year or so ago. If we can't consume it or use it, then we really don't want it around cluttering up our lives. Mm-hmm. Um, so try to go ahead and start that, but also definitely you know, get your legal affairs in order and make sure you understand your plan, how it's really going to work. Um, and our law firm obviously can't help everybody, but we um, know of the other lawyers that can help. And we're really good about sending you to places that we think um, you people that you think you would connect with yeah. um, well. So we can definitely be a referral source. Yeah, that's fantastic. And we, we do have an estate program where we can also offer that referral service. So we're all here to help you. Mariah, thank you so, so much for thank you all coming on today. And I know we're going to have yeah. you on again. I appreciate you so much. Thank you, my darling. I look forward to uh, working on some collaborative things in the future to help the public. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I, I think we're going to do Bye, guys. great things. Thank mm-hmm. you so much, Mariah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Bye. Bye. You're welcome. I had a long conversation with Mariah yesterday, and I knew. So she came from a place of education, and she called me all excited to say, I can't believe you're doing this program to help people going through this because of the big mound of things. I had no idea anything like this it's, existed. It's, it's very touching, though. Isn't it? Think Isn't about it. it. It's, yeah. it's very touching. Thank you, guys. Give us a call if you're going through anything like this. Mountainhomehunt.com. Mountainhomehunt.com. Click on Contact Us. We'll see you on the radio next week. This has been the Plain English Real Estate Show with Rowena Patton. Visit Rowena and post your questions at RadioAsheville.com or call her at 828-210-1648.